think uh, we will get started. Good morning. Uh, I think there's a few more people coming. So we're also virtual. Um, we're really excited. First of all, GNI is beyond excited to be here and partnering with uh, Atlantic Care. And um, this is our last series of our grand rounds. Um, we have a pretty robust grand rounds, which is um, uh, pretty much national. We usually have speakers from around the country, and we really focus on neurosciences in general and healthcare. So you'll never see us talking about a super hyper focus. If, if many of you have seen some of the neuroscience talks, it's usually a surgeon with like operating and showing how they're putting a clip on an aneurysm or 50 before and afters of strokes of opening up a vessel. So this morning we're gonna kind of go up to 30,000 feet and I put together a bunch of different things and everything that I'm gonna talk about this morning is, are things that we're doing now and we are going, either are doing now or going to be doing right here at Atlantic Care. And I think everybody's gonna, you'll see, be very, very excited. Um, and so again, I want everyone to kind of step back and get up to 30,000 feet and that's what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about everything that's gonna encompass clinical pathways to hospitals. So I'm gonna start off with something that may not sound very neurosciences, which is the history of the telephone. And if you stick with me, you'll see throughout this talk that there's a lot of analogies here. And <clears throat> for most people that don't know, the telephone's been around since 1869. It's been around for a very, very long time. And this is actually, was even earlier than this, but this is the first time that it was actually in people's homes. And if you look at the timeline, we went from, and this is gonna age everybody in the room, I know it always does me, because when you see these phones, you're gonna remember that point in your life when it kind of became important to you. For me, it was this, because it was the first time that when I was on the phone with my friends or a girlfriend, I didn't have to take the kitchen phone and go into another room with a long stretched out cord so no one could hear me, it was wireless. Um, and then I think most of the people in this room remember this, the first cellular phone. And if, if we look at this time frame, this transition from that first phone and the first concept of transmitting voice to what we do with, with smartphones now has taken a really, really long time. And it wasn't driven by technology. It was driven by people thinking outside the box. And you know, I think we all know that the latter with the smartphones was Steve Jobs to look at this and say, a phone isn't just a device to communicate by talking to people, it's, our, it's gonna be our, our music, it's gonna be our bank, it's gonna be our a way to communicate with people around the globe, um, that it becomes this, this much bigger entity. Um, and you know, this is what we know today, smartphone isn't just the physical phone, it's, it's what's inside it. So I want, I want you to keep that idea in mind. So we're gonna start with stroke and you know, stroke, I think it's really important to understand. We've been doing some great uh, outreach to some of the EMS and primary cares. And, you know, I think we've been treating stroke for so long, some of us tend to forget the history of it. This isn't new. Thrombolysis, doing mechanical thrombectomies, comprehensive stroke centers. This concept's been around for a long time. So for those of you that don't know, the medical management, this is what stroke care used to be. It was ba very strongly neurology driven. Um, patients came in with strokes, and if they didn't have a hemorrhage, they went to a medical floor, and we didn't really have many tools then. It was, okay, there's a stroke, and it was more education of, you know, where's this lesion localized to, and they went to rehab, and most of those patients, if not all, really did not do very well. And then IVTPA came along. It's been 1996, so put, keep that in mind. 1996, that's a long time ago where we started doing IVTPA, and it's still a mainstay. We're at Connect a Place now, which is just a different mode of the same thing. But this jump from the 1960s, 70s to 96, and then to endovascular clot removal, 2000, this was 25 years ago that we started doing this. And actually, I'll show you a little bit even earlier than that. This is the first kind of you know, FDA approved, and for those of you that remember, the older folks in the room, the Mercy device, which is the first one. And it's, this timeline is the same thing as the phone. It's just taken too long. We've taken decades to make these, these leaps. So again, this isn't new. This is a case of mine from, um, I think, 2000, where we didn't have devices. We were using other types of devices that were meant for capturing coils that flew away and other things to break up clots. Because we understood the concept that if an artery shuts down and we reopen it, that some patients can do really well. We use balloons to open them up. Um, and then this was the first FDA device, the Mercy device, which was this corkscrew device 
and you see this clot that's caught on the end of it. And actually, I'm looking at some of our colleagues in the IR. We did a case yesterday, and how common is it that we pull something out like that? Not very much. A lot of times you come out and there's nothing. So this, I think, is the same slide that has been presented around the world. There's a couple of us when we first got it, you know, said, oh, wow, look at this. And, you know, I see Rudy smiling. I'm sure that you've seen this a million times because this is pretty rare. It, the, the device didn't work that great. This is where we are today. This is modern treatment. This is the first time that we figured out, okay, this is how we can do this. Again, Technology has been around a long time. The stents that we've been using in the periphery, in the coronaries, and even in the brain, we, we didn't put two and two together to think, okay, this is the best way to open up clots in the brain. And so this is, as you can see, there's a clot here in the middle cerebral artery, and this is a microcatheter. On the top is what we're doing down at the groin, and we get this catheter past the clot. And what I want you to pay attention to here is Approximately, you see all that blood's occluded. That clot is a clog in the drain. No blood can get through. This is where the revolution was. Once we unsheath this, watch what happens when the stent opens up into the clot. As soon as the stent opens up, you can see the, the blood log jam back there. Boom, as soon as that opens up, we're restoring blood flow. So now we're not picking, picking, picking while the brain is being strangulated for oxygen. We're restoring blood flow immediately. And then, yeah, sometimes we have to do a couple pulls to get it uh, uh, completely open. But this was the game changer, and this is when the outcomes started to get much better. And to keep in mind, every minute during a stroke, it's not just a stroke, but lack of blood supply to brain cells, every minute, two million brain cells die. That's why there's such a rush and there's such an urgency to timing and getting people on the table. So the very first case in the United States that was done who knows where this was done? What state? It's done in New Jersey. We did the first case up at Capitol Health. The very first case in the United States of the, the, the first stent retriever was Trebo. And we were just lucky. Everybody was waiting for the stroke to come in and you know, all the industry guys had this stuff and gals had everything in their trunks, so they were, they were waiting. So this was a case of someone in Bucks County, actually Pennsylvania, who came to New Jersey, 51-year-old, had a past medical history of AFib. Um, she was in her bedroom and her Son, 14 year old son found her on the ground, smart kid, called 911, EMS immediately got there, saw her, she couldn't move her left side, she had a huge facial, she had uh, from the facial uh, the speech difficulty. This was the early days where EMS kind of understood, this was pre-comprehensive, pre-comprehensive days, basically said, look, this is a place that's doing stuff, got her right to the holding area, very much what happens here. Um, you know, oftentimes a stroke comes, we see the patient right in the holding area because of what great efficiency there is. Um, patient was brought directly uh, uh, to the CAT scanner. There was no hemorrhage and showed up right in the uh, holding area. 1.15 p.m. This was FDA, so all these numbers are real numbers. By 1.25, 10 minutes, the patient was on the table in the IR. Uh, the initial angiogram showed at 140, we saw what we needed to see. With one pass with this, by 151, we had revascularization. So the procedure time itself was 11 minutes. That doesn't sound like, uh, I can see some of the faces, like we do this every day, and we do do this every day here. And I will tell you, not everyone around the country does this every day. Here at Atlantic Care, we do this every day because of all of you and the, the process and the efficiency and everybody understanding this. But at the time, these were patients that hours and hours and hours would be, be wasted. So this is what it looks like, and this is the only one I'm gonna show, I promise. All the stroke talks are, look at this clogged artery, look at the opened artery, look at the clogged artery, look at the opened artery. We, we gotta get beyond that, it's roto -rooter. I can teach anybody in this room how to do this procedure. Why? Because the devices are so good. Industry has made these safe, easy to use, and it's, um, it, it's not rocket science anymore. Um, it used to be a little bit more tricky, but there's the blockage, just like we saw. This is that woman. So this is what we were talking about. This is the stent retriever up, and you can see blood flow with it up is automatically restored. You can see my arrow there. There's a little bit of clot within the clot. We waited a few minutes, did a pull, and we got wide open. So this, you see all this here and you don't see it on the other side? This is what's called luxury perfusion. These are all these little arteries that you normally don't see going to the area of brain that's not getting oxygen, and it's perfusing it and pumping in all the blood and oxygen that it needs to help save these, these brain cells. So there's a clot that we pulled out, which is, again, you don't always see that. And this is, oh, let's see if I can. 
This is her. Chance that their stroke were unbelievably low, less than one percent. Can you all hear that? Factors and everything was fine. I felt fine. I was even working remotely uh, when I got home. When I got up to head out to the bathroom, I fell, and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> So the reason I'm showing that is this was on the CBS Evening News because this was like a big deal of surgical treatment for stroke. The point of that, that's her in the ICU uh, that after, late afternoon, early evening. And again, we take it for granted now where, you know, we, we kind of get used to this and accept this. But you have to think about where we were and where we are now. And that doesn't happen every day. We can get some great results like that and patients still end up with permanent deficits. So here's where, and this is something that we're going to start doing and we're working on the IRB now. What about the brain? We open up the artery and we walk away, but what about the brain? What about those tissues? What about these vessels that are desperately trying to get blood to, to cells that are on the fence? That Some are going to die, some are going to survive. We have a microcatheter sitting right here. And what do we do? We pull everything out and high five each other how great we are that look what we did. We opened up, we, we unclogged the, the drain. So we started thinking, you know, listen, we have things that we use every day. We don't have to go through some crazy FDA process. Every day we use verapamil in the brain for vasospasm and have been for, for over a decade. Verapamil, we know, is, oh, there's my, um, verapamil we know is uh, neuroprotective. Um, multiple, multiple animal models and we use it. So what we started doing was, in a protocol, sending up verapamil and injecting it to bathe all of those cells. It's a huge step forward. Is it, the, you know, is it gonna make big difference in outcomes? We don't know, but it's on the right path. We can't just open up an artery. We have to start looking at neuroprotectives. And here's the first case we did. Um, this was about seven, eight years ago. We've been doing this pretty regularly now. This is a young man, 23 years old, was bench pressing and straining and the artery dissected. And that's a very common thing in young people where you lift something heavy, either vertebral or carotid artery dissects where the layers just rip apart. And what you see here on his perfusion, this whole hemisphere is out. So we know he's got an occlusion way down low. And these are bad, bad, bad to, to deal with uh, mechanically to try to open up. We just did one yesterday because they're not easy. It's organized clot and also the patients don't do well. This is his carotid in his neck. We opened it up, put a stent. Once we opened that up, there was this clot, you know, blah, blah, blah. We opened it up. Great, we got a great result. But what about that brain in the 23-year-old? So this was the first one where we actually injected that verapamil. He did very well. I mean, does, we have no idea if he would have done well without this or not, doesn't matter. I, I can pull this room. How many of you would want us to inject verapamil in your loved one's brain after a thrombolysis and after a mechanical thrombectomy? pretty much everybody, right? There's no downside to it. We do it every day for other things. We're just doing it for a different reason. And this is, this is some of the earlier work that this isn't like just pie in the sky, we figure this out. And this was in 2016 where people are still doing this in animal models. We don't need animal models. We, have, we, we can do this in humans every day. We're doing it now and again. And that's kind of what I wanna talk about again about be, thinking outside the box. So that's, that's just a study. I also don't want to forget, and I want everybody to realize and remember, we talk about stroke, 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 and we think about it as opening up arteries and ischemic, it's also hemorrhagic. Even just having a, a hypertensive hemorrhage, that's a form of a stroke. That's an artery that is occluded, that is not delivering blood supply to the brain. So, you know, the most common that we think of is rupture, of ruptured aneurysms, subarachnoid hemorrhages. And this is a, a field that we've and I personally have dedicated you know, almost my entire career to because this was the dark ages. And you know, to put in, in reference, when I first started doing this, I think there, was, there were six of us as neurosurgeons doing open and endovascular. To tell you how old I am, Dr. Stid, who used to be here, his, the person that trained him was my fellow at Jefferson. So that, basically, I'm an old guy. But the point is, is this has been around a while. And even today, there are still centers where if you come in with an aneurysm, you're going to the operating room. They'll give you every excuse of, well, endovascular and there's a recurrence. It's getting less and less. But, you know, this is when I first started training, these aneurysms that were wide neck, this is how we treated them. You know, everybody went to the operating room. That bottom left corner is, is uh, uh, an aneurysm that we had to reconstruct with clips. And this is what's called the picket fence technique. And I remember being in a lecture when I was, I think I was a fellow, 
and hearing a very famous open vascular neurosurgeon, and, and this is, was a slide from his paper, and I'm like, the hell? I mean, there's like nine clips on this, all that for this little blister, and opening up the head, and so we started thinking there's gotta be a better way. So when we talk about innovation and changing things, you know, people start to think about gene therapy and AI and all that, we're gonna talk about that today. But let's talk about basic stuff. I think most people would agree there's gotta be a better way. This is not that complicated. But if you keep doing something the same way all the time and you get really good at it, you're not inclined to want to change. So we, we developed this. It's called a chip clip. Um, and just because, think about the clips you put on your, ba your uh, uh, bag of chips and pretzels at home. And we're like, why put all these on here? And this is one of the first cases that we did um, where uh, this is uh, Harad uh, Hidayat, who was one of our fellows. And um, you know, it was an aneurysm pointing straight up. And rather than stack all these clips, it's just a chip clip going straight down and just pinching the aneurysm off. Um, you know, one and done, coming right down on the top, making it easy. Very simple. This was like talking to the, the clip company and just saying, look, design this. You know, we don't want, by the way, my uh, um, uh, disclosures, everything I'm going to talk about, I have zero financial relationship with. So anyway, you can see how kind of easy it was. That was me like yell not yelling at him but like you know put it down here get it lower get it down there. so there's a little bit of hesitancy there this was the the revolution this is what started a long time ago but took a long time endovascular treatment so instead of treating aneurysms from the outside we plug it from the inside with coils the big issue back then was wide necks these coils can pop right out um, and cause a stroke so you know, we're doing brain surgery now, what was open through the wrist, you know, through the groin, but often we're just going through the wrist. Then there's stent, the, this is the next generation. So this is, these are flow diverters. You know, people hear about it. Well, this is what it is. It's basically a mesh stent that you cover the aneurysm with. And over time, the blood flow slowly diminishes and this will shut down. Normal arteries will stay open. There's just enough blood supply to keep normal vessels open but it will slowly take the pressure off the aneurysm and the aneurysm will slowly uh, shrink. I must admit, I missed this boat because um, uh, Kim, Kim, Kim Nelson, who is a, a brilliant neuroradiologist at NYU, came to my lab at Jefferson and showed me this. And I'm like, Kim, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, you really think that this thing is gonna keep that little vessel open but shut down an aneurysm? So we started doing it in, in our animal models and sure enough, it started to work. And he's a smart guy because he sold it for $178 million. Um, so I was like, okay, you were right. But this is now a mainstay in flow diverters. But think about this. Let's, let's step back now. It's great. It's wonderful. This is this huge piece of metal and stent that's in somebody's artery. So imagine this is you or your family member. You're on aspirin plavix for the rest of your life. We're putting this massive thing in somebody's vessel to do nothing more than shut down a little blister. So once again, we went back to the, the, the drawing table and said, look, there's gotta be a better way. So we developed this. So this is a, uh, basically a stent and a coil all together. Um, and it just pops in. So it acts like a stent, but it's inside the aneurysm and it just, it's unitized. So no matter how wide it is, it just pops in. But instead of it just diverting flow, what it, we can do with it is now use this and put coils in. Why is this important? Because for those of you that seen the web device, which someone overthought it, and it's just one and done, you put it in. If it recurs, you got a big problem because you can't reaccess that aneurysm. With this, if there's coil compaction, things like that, you can go back in and put more coils. Again, this isn't rocket science. All the technology was there. It was just sitting down with engineers, sitting down with people outside of our realm to say, can you make this? And almost always the answer is like, yeah, that's easy. So with that concept, I want everyone to think about this. So for the first time, the first time in the history of mankind, let alone healthcare, we have technology that's outpaced what we know what to do with. So not that long ago, it was always, well, we have to do this because there's no other way to do it. We don't have this device. We don't have that. Just like the telephone. See, I told you we'd come back to it. You know, how do we get this to this? And now we're in another conundrum because now it's, there's so much technology that you can become reckless with it. There's, there's, you know, there's a tendency now that we have the technology and it's like, okay, let's figure out something to do with it. As opposed to, here's the problem, where's the technology? So let's think about Zoom. 
Zoom has been around and the concept of Zoom has been around for a really long time. And if we had this conversation 10 years ago, people would be like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, yeah, that's great, but I'm not gonna really use it. And you know, when would I use it? How would I use it? I'm gonna FaceTime, I can do that. Zoom took off and Zoom, we're on Zoom now because of the pandemic. There became a need and technology that's been around for a really long time now became mainstay. We've gotta start thinking about the same concept in healthcare and advancing treatments for disease. So I got news. And I didn't realize this until after because I started, I'm like, when did we first, when were we first able to do this? The 1870s, you could transmit. There was technology to be able to transmit an image all the way back into the 1870s um, uh, over a wire. It, it's not, I mean, it's been around for a while. 1927 was the first time that it was actually used. There was uh, someone from Bell Technologies. Um, they, I think it was New York City to Washington they did it. Yeah. Um, and this is 1927. Think about that. Look how long it took us to kind of advance where we are now. So everybody knows this is just a different platform. We use Rapid here. So this is what we do now, right? Um, this is finally taking on. You know, doctors, uh, 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 nurses, techs, team members, we all on our cell phones, a ping goes off, and I can see the chest pain from all the IR team up there because we get these in the middle of the night, um, where this is on your cell phone. No human is involved in this. This is all artificial intelligence. There's a CAT scan. It's telling me right away there's a large vessel occlusion here and there's a normal side. You see there's a cutoff. Now I want to know, okay, can I salvage that brain? Is there a penumbra there? And so we need a CTP, right? Well, you know, artificial intelligence can do that and it can read it better than the human. Um, this was first done in, in, in chest x-rays and there we go. All that red, that blue, there's a mismatch. I can salvage this brain if I can intervene immediately. You see the telephone and the message there? I click that. We broadcast to everybody, it's a go, let's meet in the IR suite. I mean, think about this. This is no humans involved in this. We're making the judgments based on the technology, but this is no one's processing this. It's all being done by, by AI and, and uh, software. So that was a long time ago. I mean, this, this is, again, this technology has been here for a really long time. So let's start looking at the future. So what is the future of this? Just reading films on our, our phones? No, I mean, we can communicate by texting, by tiger text, by you know, 50 different platforms. So what's new and what we're gonna start doing here now, and we're actually reaching out to EMS uh, within the uh, uh, um, region, uh, some far, some close, to start using facial recognition and bring in EMS as partners. Who sees these patients first? It's not the ER, it's not us, it's EMS. They're the ones showing up. They're the ones that were seeing this, that uh, a woman, Eliza, who was on the floor. They're the ones that, who are, are right at the scene immediately. We are gonna arm them with this, with, with artificial intelligence that's explainable. And I'll tell you what that means. What that means is that with a phone or a tablet, when they're in the field, they're gonna examine the patient. And they're gonna say, sir, raise your arms. Smile. Tell me your name. Say no ifs, ands, and buts. Repeat these things. Walk, do this. And they're just going to stand there with the artificial, with the uh, facial recognition. And what it's going to do, so here's somebody who's being read and, and has the exam. And AI, just like the reading of the films, is going to say, this patient's not, the likelihood of them having a stroke is extremely low to not zero. They're not making, we're making the call. But all this is here, and it's also video, where we can talk to EMS in the ER and say, oh, wow, okay, but you know what? I do notice this. I notice that. He's a little sleepy. It's probably a seizure. And what's really exciting about, first of all, all this gets downloaded in EMR, so everybody has access to this. And now you have the same patient, smile, and you see this facial, uh, facial immediately taking everything together, and boom, there's a large vessel occlusion. So this is basically taking the race score concept into artificial intelligence and giving us quantitative analysis. So the uh, uh, first patient that was done with this technology actually in Israel, facial palsy, um, and you can see that there's a three days before and three days after. Um, so how do we quantify improvement? This is him in the ER, smile, he's got a clear facial. This is him three days later on the right. It's quantifying, you see the graph below showing the amount of improvement. Now imagine this for our rehab co uh, uh, colleagues and physical therapy and speech where we can measure real-time improvements. Are the therapies we're doing working? How much are they working? What's not working? It, this is a, there's so many different facets to what we can do with this. It's incredible. So let's start thinking about 
neurosciences. Okay, why is neuroscience is such a big deal? We'll get into the why the you know like everything in life, it comes down to two things, and you know one of the first things is is uh, uh, money, and the second thing is I think everybody knows what that is, but the the first thing with finances is why neuroscience has got driven. But we now need to start rethinking because with this technology, with the process changes, it can't just be neurosurgery, neurology, psychiatry, pharma, all these things have to come under one umbrella together as a team. No longer specialty, but disease. So neurosurgery, neurology, neuropsychology, neuroplastics. Does anybody know what neuroplastic surgery is? You're gonna see what it is and that's why our, our uh, our colleagues at Longevity who sponsored this in the breakfast, by the way, are, are, are innovators in this. And it's a small company, very small. NeuroED, started the first NeuroED in the country. We're hopefully going to be instituting that here very soon. And you'll see why it works. It's not a marketing gimmick. There's data that shows the patients do better. Neuropharmacy, so our colleagues in pharmacy. There is no subspecialization in pharmacy. So think about the drugs we use in the neurosciences. It, antipsychotics, antiepileptics, uh, uh, anticoagulation, all these very, very complex medications. And I'm telling you as a physician, we can't manage that anymore. It's, there's no longer Dilantin, Keppra. It's a very, very complicated, um, it, very complicated for the patient, um, for the, the neurokinetic, I mean, for the pharmacokinetics. We need specialty people. So we started um, by a brilliant pharmacist we work with who just was rounded with us every morning in our multidisciplinary rounds. We were just like, you know what, you need to be on our team. Then we started thinking clinical pharmacists, see patients with us. When we're done seeing patients and they have all these medicines, well, I don't know, talk to your primary care doctor, talk to your psychiatrist, talk to, she goes in the room, she reconciles the drugs, she talks to them, she calls them, she calls the primary care doctors to help manage. You know, this is, this is where we need to go. Why isn't everybody doing it? Because it doesn't pay. There's no reimbursement for it. That's not the reason not to do it. You have to pay it forward. Neuromedicine, we're starting that now. We'll talk about that. Telemedicine, practical telemedicine, not robots that are going to try to replace human beings. It's very loud and clear. Patients don't want that. It's not a good thing. We cannot replace what all of us do in this room with a robot. It's not going to happen. It can help connect us, but it's not going to replace what we do. And then neuroimaging, which I think is one of the, and neuroengineering are the two most exciting things. So again, I, I told you, we're gonna keep coming back to this. This is a smartphone. Think about your smartphone, but think about neurosciences as a smartphone with all of these things uh, together. And the silos are what we need to break down. And with that comes some challenges, but you look at all of these different things, we're all in silos. And the biggest silo is industry. So, you know, I wanna, I wanna let everybody in on a little secret. All of the cures in medicine, in our lifetime anyway, and I think in the future, all of the advances, they're coming from industry. It, it's a fact. Who came up with the vaccine for COVID? One NIH, wasn't Johns Hopkins. You saw them on the news all the time. Who came up with the cure? The brightest, the smartest, people with the money who are in the lab working on this every day. You look at every single either device, medication, and even concept of AI, it's all coming from industry. So what have we done in healthcare over the last 20 years? Industry's here and we're here. Why? Because of the conflict. Well, that's a really easy thing to do. I can work with my colleagues in industry, but you know what? I have to be very transparent. Somebody can click on my name and say, you know how much financial reward I'm getting from this or I'm getting paid as a consultant, a cup of coffee? Zero. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You can do that. You should do that if you come up with an idea and you work with industry, but it has to be transparent to the patient so that when they come in, they're like, okay, are you pushing this because you're a shareholder and you have a piece of the company? Or are you working with industry to come up with a, with a solution? So keep that in mind. But we're not going to get anywhere without pushing industry away. Our model and what we're going to do and what the, the CE, your, your, your new CEO and leader here, Michael Charlton, and, and, and his team have really come to the forefront of this. And, I, and I, I want to make sure everybody understands that. Oracle, Cleveland Clinic, Drexel, bringing industry in and having everybody have a seat at the table so we can advance things. And that's a, that should be really exciting to everybody because I'm gonna show you what we can all do together when we, when we think that way, not the normal academic hospital hierarchy. Um, and what, what's really sad is if you think about it, let's talk about cancer. So imagine if every center in this country, pediatrics, adult, 
um, you know, hematologic, neuro, um, pro every cancer shared their data. Imagine that. Penn, Cleveland Clinic, um, Mayo, uh, MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Imagine if they had an open thing and they all shared their data and they shared their research. Wouldn't that be incredible, right? That we're all, it doesn't happen right? Because it's proprietary. It's, 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 it's ours. We're not, we don't want you to know about it until we've already done it. And, we've, and that's keeping us behind. So this guy, I don't know if anybody knows who this is, probably not. Um, this is a, a, a colleague of mine and a very good friend, Jay Storm, um, who's the chair of neurosurgery at CHOP. And he called me a while, you know, it's about almost 10 years ago. And he said, Errol, you know, I want to I do this. I want to start for pediatric tumors. I want to set a data bank where we all share it. We're going to get the big institutions that do high volume, and we're going to do a database where we share all these, the, this tissue together, and we'll all share in it. We'll all do, you know, but it's the common cause. And we now have what's called PC4C. Um, GNI is the only non-academic, we're not a hospital, we're not, but we're partners with that. And Dr. Atom Sarkar, who's our chief, um, is directing this. And every piece of tissue that we get, we put into this database, adult and pediatric. Um, this is how we have to start thinking. So let's talk about neurosciences a little bit, and in, in, again, going even higher up. One billion people a year are affected by a neurologic disorder in, in the world, a billion. Think about that. Um, that's more than all cancers combined. It's a leading cause of disability, and there's no dedicated center. You know, I, I, I give this a version of this lecture a lot nationally and around, and it's, it's always amazing to me. I'll ask, um, what's the best orthopedic hospital in the country? It depends where I am. So I'm like, well, it's here, you know. But for the most part, HSS in New York City, that will always come. It's the first kind of freestanding, dedicated, multidisciplinary, independent hospital. Talk about eye, ophthalmology. Most people will say Wills. Um, some will say Shea. There's Bascom in, 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 in Miami. But, you know, most people will come up with Wills. Cancer, it's always between MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Then I say, what about neurosciences? Always silence. Always silence. Because if you think about it, where is the Neuroscience Center of Excellence? Why don't we have one? There's a billion patients, way more than cancer, definitely more than eye and even orthopedics. So, you know, that's something that has driven me for the last, you know, decade. And, you know, this is just a breakdown. Neurosciences is not going away. The prevalence and incidence is only increasing. As the population ages and as our imaging gets better, we're understanding more and more. Therefore, we're diagnosing more and more. Um, you know, dementia never used to be what it is now. I mean, now it is, you know, we're seeing people younger, we're understanding these diseases. Um, so it, this is not going away. And let's get back to the finances, because then it's like, okay, well, why isn't there a neuroscience center of excellence? Uh, it must not be profitable. It's, it is surpassed, this is an older slide, it is surpassed cardiology. If you put neurology and neurosurgery together, it is a number one generating revenue source for any healthcare system. So you have all these things together, perfect storm, right? So I, I'm, I'm, it looks like I'm skipping around, but I'm not. If anybody can tell me besides Rudy what this is, I'll buy you any drink you want. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. That's a microcatheter right there in a vessel. And this is a, a conglomerate of abnormal blood vessels. And I love doing this, especially with my, my, my vascular colleagues. So, oh, it's an AVM, it's a cavernoma with a D, you know, it's, this is a GBM, it's a brain tumor. This is one of the most malignant brain tumors that there are. And I would, I would argue it's the most malignant type of cancer that any human being can have. And for those of you that have seen it, either in your patients or unfortunately have had family members that have had this, it's a horrible disease with a horrible outcome. We've made no good improvements in 50 years. 50 years, the outcomes are the same. So. This is something that we used to see all the time. We do a lot of angiograms, and some people also have a malignant brain tumor, and you see this blush. What this is, is blood vessels and arteries that are feeding that tumor. They're giving it the nutrients to grow, to, to, to the cells to duplicate. So, you know, well, if we just shut the artery down and we give a stroke to the tumor, it, no, the, the cells are much smarter than that, and they're secreting chemicals that are re reorganizing other cells that are going to come back. That's why GBM keeps coming back, even after you remove it. So with one of our colleagues uh, who at the time was at, at Cornell, who did all the hard work, the animal model work of breaking down the blood brain barrier, said, why don't we deliver chemotherapy? 
instead of giving it in the IV, where only about 20% gets to the brain, your hair falls out, you become immunocompromised, why don't we douse that brain tumor, because we have the vasculature, we know where it is, directly with these chemotherapeutic agents. It was brilliant. Um, and uh, it's, his name's John Bookfar. For those of you that watch that um, Netflix series, Lennox Hill, that's, he's the one who takes his shirt off all the time. Um, we were talking about that last night. Um, and that's this, that blood vessel there is this. That's a GBM. And this is the first patient that we did um, at Capital Health. Uh, God, this is about 11, 12 years ago. It was a young guy who was at Penn, had surgery twice, radiation, nothing against Penn. It was just that's, to this day, that's all we have. Keeps coming back, keeps coming back. He was the first person we enrolled in this. And these are three, this is what we started with after he had surgery, resected two, I'm sorry, this is after his resection of two times. This is what he started with. Two surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy. Now he can't really talk. He's starting to lose the right side of his body. I mean, really nice guy. This is after the first injection of, of we, we use the Vasin, just melted away. Symptoms got better. You see the edema is now, all that edema is gone. Now the problem is, is this isn't a long-term thing, but what it is, and this is where the, the hardcore academicians like, well, you know, it's a vaccine and it's temporary and it's not curing it. No, it's not curing it, but this is a gateway and a different way to think about treating the disease. We don't have the right drug yet. That's where we have to go out and talk to our colleagues in, in pharma to come up with the right drug. And I don't know, I mean, to, to put in context what a horrible disease this is and what a horrible job we've done in neuro, uh, the, I don't know if anybody remembers this, it was like the front of people. It was a young woman who was diagnosed this, and she's like, all right, very smart young lady. I see what this outcome's gonna be. The hell no. I'm gonna control my own life. And I think, yeah, uh, uh, within three months, she, she basically decided to, to take her own life for this. And that's a really sad statement for us. With all this technology and everything else, we just keep going back to the same well. So we've gotta do better. So I'm gonna kind of, shift gears now to this. So everybody in this room that, especially in the ICU and, you know, does anything with neuro understands what this is. This is a hypertensive hemorrhage. This is one of the most common bleeds that we see. It's not life-threatening. Um, there's no, you know, herniation of the brain. There's no vessel to open up. The vessel ruptured, uh, but it's in a really bad area. It's in the deep basal ganglion. That's why these patients are densely plegic, you know, have facials and everything else. And what do we do with these patients? They languish in the hospital for weeks. They sit in an ICU. We wait for the blood to resolve. We wait for them to get to rehab. And we know as this blood breaks down, it's toxic. It's toxic to the cells around it. So the problem is, and you know, over 30 years, we thought of different ways to remove it, but every surgical approach causes more damage because it's deep and getting out the clot causes more damage than just leaving it alone. But it's a huge, un this is the last desert, I, I think, of, of, of cerebrovascular disease. Um, you know, there's 100,000 patients a year that suffer from this. Think about our unit. Just look at our unit, how many basal ganglion hemorrhages come in every day. Um, and it's, it's a huge, huge, huge market. And if you look at our treatment, 75% of patients today get treated medically, 75%. The only patients that really make it to the surgical arm for the most part are ones that have edema that's life-threatening and we have to decompress. And even then we just basically pop the bone plate out. So why am I showing a picture of arthroscopic knee surgery? How many neurosurgeons, I mean, we, we, as, you know, we have a very uh, um, lively and, and camaraderie between orthopedics and neuro neurosurgeons going back to medical school. And we each decide what path we want to go on of us making fun of the orthopods with, you know, uh, lots of things. They make fun of us for being geeks. And, but, you know, we don't talk to each other outside of spine. So think about what they're doing here. They're doing this complex knee surgery through these little portals. Well, doesn't it make a lot of sense for us to be doing that in the brain through a tiny little portal with a technology? So there's a, let's look at that. And this is, these are the trials that went through. This is what we do. We open up the brain, you know, classic neurosurgery, go down, dig around, pull, retract, suck out the clot. That's not a step forward. Um, yeah, we're making the CAT scan look better with the blood clot, but we're causing oftentimes more damage than good. Then came around, and I know we have one here, the Apollo device, um, which is just, um, it's a great concept, but you can see what it is here. It's this huge stort scope, takes two surgeons, one to hold, you need image guidance. It's this whole production. It's not something you're gonna do in the middle of the night. Um, it's still a pretty big access point. 
So one of my colleagues asked me um, that I used to work with, it used to be in the neural world, said, you know, hey, Errol, can you take a look at this? This is a new device for orthopedics. It's a handheld disposable device that in the office, instead of getting an MRI, you take this trocar, you numb up the knee, you put it in, and you get like, you know, 4K images of meniscus, seeing what's going on there. You can drain fluid, you can irrigate. He's like, do you think there's a neuro? And I was like, absolutely. So what we did was, and this is what it looks like, um, it's literally handheld, disposable, suction irrigation, incredible little, you know, great visualization on this tiny little screen. So what we did was we went to an industry to uh, Penumbra, which is a company that makes Apollo, and I said, this is why people, this isn't taking off. It's too hard to use. It's a pain in the ass. You've, you've got two neurosurgeons, you're taking up an OR, you need image guidance, you need a Stortz device, you need all this stuff. I said, you've got to make it more simple. And so I said, let's combine these things. And with their engineers, we developed this. So this device that goes through one handheld device where you can suction, irrigate the stars, the image guidance, everything connected where one person can do it through a hole the size of a dime where you can visualize and go and you don't need image guidance. You're going right in just like we do for a ventriculostomy every day. There's a clot, suction, irrigate, take it out. So this was, um, and this is the, the first prototype. We started doing this at a fellows course um, just to kind of use these are called gel heads where they're great. There's a little clot in here and you can kind of see it. And then because in case those of you that haven't figured out, even if you've never met me before, I was saying I have a little bit of ADD. I'm like, we got to get this going. So this is the height of COVID. And again, I said, what are the FDA indications for this device? I said, any closed cavity in the body? Last I checked, the brain's in a closed cavity in the human body. There's no FDA restriction to this. So with this, this is a, a case that we did. Um, again, this is the height of COVID. And there it is. We got, I and mean, there's no reason you, you can't do this in a human. So what you saw before with all these people, um, there's, if you can remember, handsome Ken Liebman there. Um, and there's someone else in here that you'll all, one of our fellows that some of you will remember. But anyway, you can see where it's just one person coming in. And I just want to fast forward here where you can see the screen. Anyway, the, you can see, you know, beautiful images. Actually, it's a little um, right there through a port all handheld. Again, not rocket science. It's just taking different technologies together to come up with a better solution. Um, so now it's a really, really cool stuff. So this is the future. Um, this is tracks, white matter tracks in the brain that, this is MRI, this is diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging. Um, there's different variations of this, including spectroscopy and um, fMRI, functional MRI. We can see what people's brains are doing in ways we were never able to do before. While patients are lying on an MRI table, with a screen above them, we can show them images of things. Scary things, happy things, things, memories, and we can see where the areas of the brain are functioning or not functioning. So think about that. So this is a real human where we wanted to see different pathways, and we first started looking at this for helping us for really complex brain tumors so I can see where the pathways are and we can merge this with image guidance in the operating room so we can stay away from these pathways while we're operating on things like brain tumors. But this is a brain tumor that's already been operated on. It also can show us at a molecular level what's edema and swelling, what are brain tumor cells in a very, very, very complex way um, and give us this imaging, just like CT perfusion. Um, so this. This, again, this technology's been around for, for a while, but what's really exciting now, and one of the, I think, the futures of neuroscience is this functional neuroscience, um, functional neurosurgery to be, to be exact. So this is a patient with Parkinson's disease, and we can interrupt these pathways, stimulate or interrupt, to get rid of tremors that are debilitating for not just Parkinson's patients, but people with essential tremor, which um, you know, is, is incredible. But we can also look at other things like depression, OCD, Tourette syndrome, schizophrenia. We understand where these pathways are now for the first time because of this imaging. And we know that we can stimulate these different pathways to, to help cure disease. So this is a patient who, uh, I'll let the video speak for itself. I had essential tremors and after my surgery, I, I am completely recovered from the surgery and my hands are, I can do 
my normal life. So this is her baseline. She has an essential tremor, which is um, not Parkinson's, but you can see how this, she's trying to make a circle. So you'll see this live. This is really cool. That's Dr. Sarkar, who's our chief of functional brain. neurosurgery. So what's going to happen is she's in the operating room, awake. Her brain's anything, exposed, but you'll hear through a small opening. Now, do you mind letting us see your arm? Okay. Now, slowly bring that towards your face, and just hold it there. There, exactly. Okay. So that's what we're going to see, and that's what we're going to fix. Okay. Okay. Eventually, stopped going out to eat. My hands would shake so much I yeah. couldn't keep the food on my fork, and I would lean. I would eat like a dog. So I just want to get to the point. So this is in the operating room. Uh, now hold it out like giving a toast. Great. Now bring it towards your face. Wow, that looks really, really good. Yes. What do you think? Yes. Yes, I agree. It's wonderful. I go to concerts. I was on a concert on Sunday, and I go out to eat, and it's just enjoyable. Watch her make those circles now. So this is, we're going to start doing this here. I think, Rob, we can just next week, right? We're getting through it. I mean, this is, it's been, <laughs> it's been done for a while, but... This is, we're gonna start doing this here now, um, and it should be done here now. There's a massive amount of patients that need this type of surgery. Here's where the even more cool stuff comes. So this is a, um, these are functional images of a patient with major depressive disorder. We know those pathways for the most part. Now, we, we, this is why it's very important where we break down silos and we have neuroscience departments because we need our psychiatry colleagues to really help us understand because listen, if you don't go through depression in your life, you're not human. It's part of being a human being. So what depression is, it's episodic because of an event. What is genetic? What is neurochemical? That's why some people do really well with, with antidepressants and other people don't. Um, but we know the wiring in the brain for everybody's different. So just like Parkinson's disease, we can see these pathways and use this deep brain stimulation to reverse the effects of, of depression in, in a highly select group of patients. We can also do it, and we have done it, Dr. Sarkar has done it, for OCD and for Tourette syndrome, um, because those are pretty clear pathways. So let's get into practice. It's hydrocephalus, basically fluid on the brain, big, big ventricles. Um, same thing, we, we kind of have a normal pressure hydrocephalus, overt hydrocephalus, we see it in peds, we see it in adults. And what do we do? We put shunts in, right? So people, you've seen, probably everybody in this room has seen somebody with a shunt after their surgery and they have these big bulbs sticking out of their heads. So this is where we start thinking about things as, as surgeons and not as, well, how would we feel? walking around where it's like a target. You walk around, it's, you're bald, you have thinning hair, and you've got this massive bulb sticking out of your head. So um, this is longevity. This is a device um, which is called an Invisi shunt. Oh, let me see on the way. Um, where it's basically countersunk. We basically drill out a little hole, put a thing, there's a little platform. And this is a patient. Um, Hi, I'm Michelle. This is a first patient it's from Southern New Jersey. Jersey. Really and sweet lady. She's a teacher. And second grade school teacher. You can't see her shunt. Look at her the right She's frontal aspect of her head. She's got a little bit of a receding hairline. With a shunt, she would have this huge bulb sticking out, which is debilitating um, psychologically. And so she so has a shunt. You don't even see it. Of course, I went online and I was able to research about the devices, the shunts that they use. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but but it just shows you like these things that aren't massive concepts make a massive difference. Um, this is another thing. This is, um, and, and I'll show you where this is leading to. Uh, this is called the clear fit. We put cranioplasties on after we have to, people have intracerebral swelling, brain tumors, infections. We take their bone plate out and then we put in synthetic ones because they're better, they're lower risk of infections. Cosmetically, it's much better. And so 
this was the, a concept of like, why are they, you can't see through them. We're closing it, sometimes blood's filling up. Um, you know, this is a clear thing where as we're closing, if we start seeing fluid coming up, we can actually see it, take it out. And because a lot of times after the surgery, um, you can have devastating bleeds. And that was, I think, the initial concept. But then it started to grow from here. And it, working with a team at Johns Hopkins and, and somebody who started a specialty of neuroplastic surgery, which took a long time to catch on because neurosurgeons didn't want to hear from a plastic surgeon that, you know, we don't do a great job cosmetically. Um, and it's, you know, for the most part, it's, it's true. We're thinking about the brain. But what we can do with this now, and we are going to start doing this, actually we're going to host a uh, tri-state uh, physician's assistant meeting here to train them how to do this here in Atlantic Care, actually in this very space. So this is a patient that had a bypass. This is from um, our colleagues at NYU that did one of the first cases. This is, this is what a bypass looks like with a CTA, which is pretty cool. You can see it. We want to know whether that bypass is still functional when we see patients. So what do we do? We get CTAs. We take them to an angiogram. Well, now with this clear fit, this is the window we have. So in the office, we can take an ultrasound and see if it's patent. I mean, if it's, if it's patent, without sending the patient to a CAT scan, without, same thing with a brain tumor. We can use ultrasound now. The, the sensitivity of ultrasound is light years of where it used to be. We can see brain tissue. We can see fluid collections. We can look at the vasculature. So we now have a window into people's brain in an outpatient setting just using ultrasound. And what we can also do with this, now keep in mind that plate. Okay, that plate that's in someone's skulls. Lots of people you, you wouldn't even know were walking around have these plates in their skull. And neuroprosthetics, much like deep brain stimulation, is a new thing. So this is p p patients that are paralyzed from the neck down, plegic in their arm. We can stimulate, this is called the Utah array. We can put these little tiny arrays on the brain to stimulate in the motor cortex, connect it to motor limbs, and start to get movement. Um, but this is what it is. This is a kind of you know, early technology, but still kind of what it is. And let me show you what it actually does. So this is a, this is a first woman that had, this is at Brown University. She's moving this bottle and this arm with her brain. So she's basically that, what her brain, the firing of the synapses is basically electrically connected to this robotic arm. So she's doing this just by, you can see her arm, she's trying to do it. And she's moving that just by her brain by the stimulation of those cells. So pretty archaic looking from what's in her head and all that, but the concept. So now let's think about that plate. Let's think about putting all that technology into a plate that's this big. So it's basically a battery pack, it's a computer. It's a computer in our skull that can control our brain. So it could be DBS, it could be depression, it could be paralysis, where now you're, all that is connected internally. When we do a lot of these surgeries, um, you know, stimulators, things like that, the number one morbidity is they come back every six months because the leads are rode through, they're all through the neck, they're, patients are covered in scars. So this is a new concept of, of looking and using, having a smartphone in our skull. Um, and I'm gonna kind of finish with this. So this is, this is the newest technology that's going to be coming out. This is the first case done at uh, Hopkins. That's Chad Gordon, who's the one who, who, um, you know, was the neuro, who started the neuroplastic uh, uh, fellowship idea. He's a plastic surgeon. Actually, he's a Philly guy. This is a young kid who um, was in a motor vehicle accident, had um, a depressed skull fracture, had a cranioplasty. You can see here's the clear fit. Um, and this is a big problem because in kids, after you put this in, they start to get hydrocephalus. And mom calls and says, you know what, um, you know, especially in younger kids, they don't communicate well. So a lot of times irritability, crying, complaining of a headache, is it the pressure in the head that's high or are they just you know, being a normal kid? So this is now Bluetooth technology where there's an implant in the brain that can basically, just like we do with loop recorders and things like that, mom can now call the office and you can get on a computer and say, oh, the ICP-7, don't worry about it, you know, from another state. So this is, this is going to open up a whole other world where the next step of technology is, you know what, it is a little bit high. We can, we can change your shunt setting. We can drain more fluid. We can open up a valve and we can do it all wirelessly. Um, we're doing it with seizure monitoring. Um, this is a typical EMU. 
This is where a patient, you have a, a video EEG monitoring, you need a full-time tech, you need the neurologist, you have somebody reading from somewhere else, patients in the ICU, in bed, connected. This is replacing this. So this is called a, a cerebral, and it's basically a band that goes around the head. It connects to this where people at the bedside can see the EEG, and it's, it can be sent by Bluetooth technology. And this is the first device, first of all, that really works. Um, and we, we went through the biggest critics of, of EEG neurologists, of, of epileptologists, and you know, they were just like, this is almost as good as being in an EEG, and it's only getting better. So now imagine, let's talk about us here, patient at Mainland, starting to have seizures. Put them in an ambulance, come over here, they've got to be in 24-hour EEG monitoring. Our affiliate hospitals that are you know, not equipped to do this, what do they do? They put them in, they, they send them out. We clog beds to have these patients. Nine times out of 10, it's not a seizure. So we use this in our network every day. Get a call from, say, Nazareth Hospital in Northeast Philly. Hey, Earl, I got a guy down here. I'm not sure what's going on. I am not sure if it's a seizure. Prior to this, we were shipping them out. Now, they, the nurse puts this on, gets a read. Our epileptologist looks like, yeah, there's no seizure activity. Great, done, we ruled out seizures, admit, start doing the other workup. Um, so again, using this technology for other things as well. And then in the operating room as well, this is really exciting. This is a Zeiss microscope where we can start um, doing essentially like electron microscopy in the operating room live. And what happens is we look at tissue um, through this little kind of scope and it gets transmitted to the pathologist. So the pathologist, the neuropathologist is sitting at their station and they can see what we're seeing live time in the brain, say, I need this tissue. That's the disease tissue. I need this to look at. And think about this for research purposes. So we're starting to use this for PC4C, where there's certain areas and certain cell types that we want to see and we want to study. Because normally we lop out brain, it goes, and it's like you kind of get what you get. This, again, is breaking down silos where everybody is being connected you know, virtually and being able to see the same thing and not be in the same place. So, I'm gonna move forward a little bit here. Um, let me just see for, yep. Yeah. So where, where we're going with all of this, this is something we're doing here now too. Uh, and by the way, just for the people, uh, I think we, our length of stay went from what, 10 days to four days and months with this model. Um, so you know these models work and it's also most importantly better patient care. So why haven't our hospitals kept up with all this technology? So this is us as device. Why haven't the hospitals lagged everywhere? Um, here's, this was in the Philadelphia Inquirer last week. If this doesn't scare the hell out of you, I don't know what does. So this is the front page. Penn Medicine wants stroke, heart, and other acute patients transferred to his hospitals as quickly as possible for their health and its finances. They're basically openly saying, we do better financially. And this is a case that they highlighted. This is last week. Ambulance that rescued, and this is, you know, it's, it's in the paper. So Betty Hayes, after March at her church, she was in uh, uh, Grandview Hospital two hours later. Like, they're celebrating this. Like, this is a great, she had a cute stroke. Two hours later, she's at the University of Pennsylvania, and now we're, we're, they're treating her. This is a real problem. I mean, this is like, people need to step back and say, whoa, wait, stop. This, this, this is what used to be 20 years ago. And all the things that I've just been talking about that we move forward, and it's this idea that they're trying to make this sound like, well, we're, we're the big academic institution. This is where it should be done. It's a real problem. So I love this. The pessimist complains about the wind. Optimist expects it to change. And the leader, all of us, uh, adjust, excuse me, adjust the sales. Um, so this is the model, a departmentless hospital. No departments, no divisions. Think about the word division. We have divisions in medicine. What does a division mean? <laughs> think about it, look at a dictionary. It's, a, it's, it's amazing um, how we, we don't think the right way. So a departmentless specialty center. And if you look at the ecosystem, it's not complicated. And this is where things got muddled too, where doctors wanted to become administrators, administrators didn't trust doctors, you know, industries on the outside trying to get in the door so that we can kind of advance things. So it's doctors, hospital, industry. That's the ecosystem. Everybody has their part, but we're all doing things and marching in the same direction for the same goal. So imagine a place that looks like this, where you walk in the door and you're there for a neurological problem epilepsy, autism, stroke, brain tumor, back pain, you name it. It has to do with the neurosciences, billion patients. 
you walk through the lobby, you have one of these problems, and you now have, this is what it looks like. Um, so there's reality here. This, these these uh, schematics are not cheap, I can tell you. And there's three different buildings. But guess what? They're not different buildings. They're not silos because they're all connected by that lobby. You push an elevator, you make a right, you make a left. And one of them is a hospital where patients are being treated in a highly specialized center. One of them is industry. Yes, industry in the hospital. Imagine that. And the other is research, innovation, think tank center, health policy, and all that. All combined under one roof, common spaces, and brilliant term that my mentor, uh, Nick Hopkins in Buffalo, you know, used to say this, I remember when I was a medical student, collision spaces. I love that, collision spaces, where people who don't normally talk but are doing the same thing and have the ideas for all the things I was just talking about collide together in common spaces. You know, we have this at Google, Apple, we should have this in healthcare. Um, research, and then again, the industry partners, we have, they have to be our partners. They have to be in the hospital with us. Transparent, clear lines, and that's what we're doing today. And again, that's what the new leadership here is doing. Um, Oracle, Drexel, Cleveland Clinic. I mean, this is it. The pieces are all here. The rest of it is for us to do. So I'll finish with that. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. And anybody who wants to stay and ask questions, I'm happy uh, to answer. Thank you. Any questions? That was pretty fascinating for, for what I do in the IR department. You know, with virtual lab right now, we are doing um, immobilization or lesions within the tumor. And we're also doing some wide 90 for the head of the um, For the liver, right? Um, like, just like with the brain tumor, the, the pharmaceutical is not there yet. So a lot of times we're buying in time. Which I'm very comfortable with that that space. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be curable. Does GNI and Lancer think they can pull this into the brain sometime in the near future? We can get on board with uh, starting to go in the brain and uh, treat the tumors like within like chemoembolization. Yeah, we we have patients literally little patients lined up waiting for this now, and we're just going through the. Um, uh, IRB process, which you know we, we have to do and we're doing it. It's going very quickly. We're going to be doing this very soon. And actually, Dr. Rami brought that exact point up just a few days ago about the Y90 and about what we're doing, in, particularly in the liver. And we've lagged behind in the brain because what we need is a new drug and all that. And all that is going to be out of this innovation center, and, and we're going to be doing it here. Well, we're going to be doing more of these series, two of Grand Rounds, so stay tuned. We, we usually have a break in the summer and start in the fall. We'll have uh, speakers from around the country. Um, actually, we had a head trauma expert who was supposed to be here from New York, um, and there was a conflict, so that's why I figured this would be a perfect thing to close, close the season out. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, and thanks for coming.